Well, thank you. Thank you for spending uh, uh, this wonderful afternoon. No rain so far with me, but at least you're in air conditioning. So as boring as I could probably be or as bad as I could possibly be, the advantage is you're in air conditioning. Uh, again, I, I, I don't know why any of the uh, uh, pioneers who discovered Florida thought that this would be a good place to make a home. You know, they took a look around, and there's alligators, and there's swamps, and there's humidity, and there's uh, palmetto bugs. Now, I'm a California boy. We identify them as cockroaches. Um, you know, and they there's took a, a look. Difference. Hmm? Big difference. Big difference? Oh, okay. I, I, I can understand that, yes. But <laughs> to take a look around and go, the, the only thing I can think that they were possibly thinking of is, if we build a home here, nobody would ever come to visit. This would be fine. Uh, my name is Jim Corcus. I'm, I'm a Disney historian, which means I do uh, research into uh, Disney history. Um, I write a lot of articles. I've written several books. In fact, I brought uh, copies of two of my books uh, today. So if you're absolutely fascinated uh, uh, by me, then uh, afterwards you could come up and uh, you might be interested. One of the books is... Uh, re revised Vault of Walt, which is, has a foreword by Diane Disney Miller, who is Walt's surviving daughter, and it has stories about Walt Disney that have never been published before, and stories about Disney films and Disney parks. And then the other book is called Who's Afraid of the Song of the South? And I hope you're not afraid of it. But it, it will uh, list um, uh, the entire history of the film and the facts. So it, it, it's not a call to arms for you to light torches and go storm the Magic Kingdom and demand that they release Song of the South on, on tape. It's just the background so that you know what that film is about because the Disney Company has not allowed it to be seen since 1986. Now, how many of you have seen Song of the South or ha and have that illegal copy at home that you got on eBay? All right, I, uh, all right, yes, that, that, that's all right, that's all right. And the, bu the book also contains some other stories like uh, Walt's fascination with UFOs and his attempt to um, uh, make a film based on Wizard of Oz because he bought the Wizard of Oz books. Um, but today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the film Song of the South and the, the background of that because literally there's two generations of uh, uh, folks that have grown up that have never seen the film and have no idea of its relationship to uh, Splash Mountain. Now, uh, this uh, week we actually celebrated a couple of Disney anniversaries. Uh, July 17th, of course, is the famous uh, birthday of Disneyland itself, Walt's uh, uh, Folly. And of course, uh, as we all know, that was a huge disaster uh, because they really weren't quite ready to be open on July 17th. And, um, so uh, people showed up expecting to be let in because they had seen on Walt's uh, weekly television show that he was inviting everybody to come and, and see his new Disneyland park. And they were rebuffed because they didn't have the special tickets. So they went out and they got ladders and they climbed over the fences and they dug underneath the fences to, uh, to come in. And uh, nothing worked the way that it was supposed to work on, on the Utopia. Nobody had seen the Autopia before, and so uh, what would happen is uh, people would literally jump over the fence and pull kids out of the car and take their place in the car. And there were no governors on the car because they just thought, well, the kids will start when they, they see that it comes to the end, to the unload area, they'll stop. No, they didn't. They, they pressed their foot onto the accelerator as much as they could, sped up to 20 miles an hour, and tried to run over cast members. So cast members called the area Blood Alley. And uh, of course there was no center rail, so they could get in the car and by manipulating the accelerator and all of this, you could spin the car and face oncoming cars. And of course, uh, uh, Aluminum was um, uh, one of the early sponsors of Disneyland, so the bumpers were aluminum. And they were bashing into each other. And there was a gas leak in Fantasyland. So, uh, Members of the press lined up with their cameras and uh, got up because they were hoping that there was going to be an explosion and Sleeping Beauty's castle was going to go sailing into the air like, uh, like a rocket. There was a plumber's strike. So, uh, by golly, they had to decide whether they were going to have the drinking fountains work or the bathrooms work, and they decided to have the bathrooms work. 
And then the next day in the LA Times, Walt got uh, yelled at and said, oh my gosh, he's forcing people to buy Pepsi and Coke because the drinking fountains don't work. Both, Walt had both Pepsi and Coke in uh, Disneyland on opening day because he felt there was a difference in taste and that the guests should have that opportunity to have whatever it is uh, they wanted. The, um, the asphalt uh, uh, Main Street USA uh, was still soft, and so women wearing high heels would get their high heels stuck uh, in, in, in there, and they'd have to pull out uh, their feet. And of course, you know, you know when you've, you have guests coming over to your house, how often do you expect to uh, change toilet paper? You know, well, maybe once a day, whatever. Well, that's not true when you have thousands of people coming into the park. And so you had uh, Disney management running down Main Street with rolls of toilet paper to restock the... So it was a learning experience for Walt. And uh, in 50 years, they, they've learned an awful lot. But on July 17th, it also uh, was a double anniversary for a, a, a Disney attraction that, that's been very popular called Splash Mountain. It opened uh, July 17th, uh, 1989, in um, Disneyland, and out here at Walt Disney World, it opened at July 17th, 1992. Now, uh, the official dedication was in October, but it was open July 17th, and people were writing it from July 17th right up to the official dedication, where uh, actor Jim Barney, and some of you may, uh, mm -hmm. hey Vern, uh, some of you may remember him, uh, helped, helped dedicate uh, that attraction uh, again. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Song of the South. Uh, we're also going to then lead into how this led to uh, Splash Mountain and some of those reactions. But I know that many of you came uh, uh, today because you're a big Disney fan. So as I'm talking, if something comes to you, you just raise your hand. I'll be more than happy to answer it since... We're probably never going to see each other again. I can make up anything I want. We'll all be happy, you know. <laughs> and uh, also, I was a public school teacher. I was a junior high school teacher. So uh, don't don't worry about asking me questions because I can steamroll through everything that there is uh, to get uh, where I need to be. Okay. And uh, don't worry if I just get excited and start talking fast because, as I said, I was a uh, junior high school teacher. So like most teachers, I'm. Uh, in awe of the sound of my own voice. So I'll just keep going on and on and on and on until you guys uh, uh, stop me. So um, let's start with Song of the South. Song of the South, uh, of course, was uh, based on the Uncle Remus stories. The Uncle Remus stories were written in the uh, uh, late 1800s by a newspaper reporter uh, for the Atlanta Constitution, known as Joel Chandler Harris. And as a young boy, he grew up on plantations in, in the South. And one of the things he heard were these wonderful stories that um, were, were being told. Now, these stories, of course, had their basis in Africa. In Africa, they had stories which were called the trickster tales. There was an, an, a hare, which is a type of rabbit a hare who was constantly outwitting people. And the concept of the story was even if you seem to be physically smaller and you seem to be less powerful and all of that, by using your brain, you can overcome you know, those people in your life who are physically larger and stronger, whatever. And so, of course, these were the types of stories that were brought over uh, with the African Americans who were brought over to work on the, the, the plantations. And, of course, they um, massaged the stories to include elements from their own area. So they had Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox and Br'er Bear. And Br'er, of course, means brother. It's a mixture of both brother and the French word frère, which means uh, brother. Because, again, you're dealing with Cajun. So that's where Br'er came from. And so all the animals were brotherly to each other. And so the whole point of this story was um, to teach lessons. And, and again, this has gone on uh, for centuries. You know, the, the traditional uh, uh, fairy tales, uh, like Little Red Riding Hood. Little Red Riding Hood was not designed to put children to sleep at night and tuck them into bed. You were dealing with a culture that was illiterate that didn't uh, read. So how are you going to transfer 
important information from one generation to another generation. So Little Red Riding Hood uh, was shared because it was to teach young girls, beware of strange wolves in your bed. Even though they have nice words and they seem as harmless as your grandmother, they may have another agenda. And so um, that was the purpose of, oh, you've had that experience. <laughs> oh, okay. No. <laughs> Well, then, then you've learned from those stories there that that has happened. And that was the purpose of uh, the Uncle Remus tales, too, was to pass along this information. You know, if you do this, you can save yourself. If you do that, you know, this will, this will work out for you. And so Joel Chandler Harris um, uh, took all of the stories that he'd heard from different storytellers, and he created his own storyteller, which was called Uncle Remus. And so each week in his column, Uncle Remus told a story. And these were the stories that he had heard on the plantation. They were extremely popular. They were uh, compiled into a book. Several books uh, uh, were written. And by the way, Joel Chandler Harris was a strong uh, advocate of African American rights. A lot of people uh, uh, don't uh, uh, realize that. Well, Walt, as a young boy, uh, his mom uh, especially would read to him and, and tell him stories, and some of the stories she would tell would be the Uncle Remus stories, and he just absolutely loved those. And, and he saw the possibilities, too, especially with animals that talked and uh, all of this, that this might be a good subject for animation. Uh, so when uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs became a huge hit, uh, when it was released um, in 1938, uh, uh, it actually made uh, over three million dollars, and that was when ticket prices were a dime uh, to go in and see it. In fact, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was the highest grossing film of all time when it was released. It was only uh, supplanted by uh, Gone with the Wind that showed up in uh, 1939. And so uh, Walt immediately started to look um, for other properties that he, he could use. Peter Pan, Alice in Wonderland, Wizard of Oz. And, and it wasn't just because he wanted um, a, a lot of product that he could then develop into film. He didn't want anybody else to have it and ruin those ideas. In fact, a lot of us don't realize that Wizard of Oz, as a film, only exists because of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. When Samuel Goldwyn bought the rights to Wizard of Oz, he was going to make it as a live-action film with Eddie Cantor. And Eddie Cantor was going to bump his head and dream his way to Oz, and there would be 30s uh, dance music and all of this, and then he would wake up, and it was all a dream. But as soon as Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs came out, and was a huge box office hit, MGM said, well, we've got a perfect fantasy. If people want fantasies, we'll give them a fantasy. And that is why uh, Wizard of Oz got the go-ahead uh, to get made, is because of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. So Walt was anxiously trying to, to find other properties. And so uh, Joel Chandler Harris, of course, had long since passed away, but uh, his family, his estate, still existed. And so... He talked with them and got the rights uh, to the Uncle Remus stories. And at first he was thinking of making maybe a bunch of short cartoons, very much like the Silly Symphonies that would feature these, these characters and, and these adventures. Uh, and then he was thinking, well, maybe we'll do a full-length you know, animated film based on, based on this. But then what happened is World War II. And so all of the plans that Walt had for other projects and all were put on hold as he was working on doing military training films. And he was doing them at cost, which meant that he received no profit. He only received uh, the money to cover you know, the, the raw materials, the, the, the uh, overhead of you know, paying animators and all that. There was no extra cost at all. So the Disney company was getting zero. You know, you were doing this, you were paid for that, but now you're on to the next project, but there's nothing in the bank uh, to pull from. Once the war ended, the Disney company was pretty much broke. And so, you know, there's not enough money to invest in a uh, full-length animated film. 
And uh, my gosh, a full-length animated film can take three to five years to do. So it, you know, it's very labor-intensive, cost-intensive. And one of the things that Walt learned was, I can't depend just on animation. I've got to diversify. I've got to go into live action. But there was a film company that was distributing Walt's film, RKO, and in the contract, it said that any Disney film that they uh, distributed had to be animated or have a large section of animation. Because why would you go see a Walt Disney live action film? When you think of Walt Disney, you think of animation. You know? So Walt had to maneuver and say, well, you know, in films like Three Caballeros, I did a mixture of live action and, and animation, and RKO was fine with that. Maybe I'll do the same here. I'll have a live action uh, framework, story, and then I can put in the animation, but because the live action is going to be two thirds, I can film this less expensively, I can uh, film this quickly, and the animation, since there's less animation to do, that can be done more quickly and put in there, and I can get a film distributed. And he thought that, by golly, the stories of Uncle Remus, that's the perfect thing to do. So he went out and, and he started uh, uh, talking to African-American actors like uh, Paul Robeson and uh, Rex Ingram, who played the... Uh, the big genie in the live-action uh, Heap of Baghdad, if any of you had, had seen that. He even talked to Eddie Rochester Anderson, uh, Jack Benny's uh, uh, cohort, so that would have been a much funnier Uncle Remus than what we got. And what he found, though, was James Basquette. James Basquette came in, he saw an audition uh, notice, and he came in to audition for the voice of a butterfly. Now, he had been on the Amos and Andy show playing a fast-talking lawyer, and he came in and he auditioned, and Walt heard that voice, and there was just so much warmth, he wanted to, to see Basquiat in person, and when he did, he knew he had, by golly, his Uncle Remus. And James Basquiat went on, in 1948, to get an honorary Academy Award for his role as, James, as uh, Uncle Remus. In fact, Walt uh, petitioned um, the Oscar committee that James Basquiat should get that because he was a fine person and he had created this role all by himself without the help of the director or whatever so he was the first African American male to get an Academy Award it wasn't until 20 years later that Sidney Poitier got a, uh, a competitive Oscar for uh, Lilies of the Field and James Basquiat was so talented so talented he also did the voice of Br'er Fox. So the very fast-talking Br'er Fox. He was so talented that uh, when they got around to filming the Laughing Place scene, Johnny Lee, who was the voice of uh, uh, Br'er Rabbit, was off on a USO tour. And so Basquette stepped in and did the voice of uh, uh, Br'er Rabbit. And in fact, where Br'er Rabbit laughs in that scene, that laugh is just so warm and so wonderful. They use it when Baloo tickles King Louie in Jungle Book. They use it again there. Disney Company never lets anything go to waste. You put, put that all together. And so the nine old men, uh, who uh, were the famous Disney animators, who were frustrated at doing all of these army training films, now were able to just let loose and do what they felt was some of the best animation they had ever done in their entire life, on, on these wonderful, wonderful characters. And so um, the film was filmed in Phoenix, Arizona. You couldn't film in Atlanta because it was a segregated city. In, in fact, uh, it, uh, when they did uh, In the Heat of the Night, they couldn't do it down in the South. They did that in Illinois. That was filmed in Illinois because segregation was still in place and all that. So Walt built all of those outdoor sets in Phoenix, Arizona. And Walt went and took a look around because he had to help the cameramen because the cameramen were used to framing people who were in the picture. But you're going to have animated characters. So you have to open up that a little bit to leave room for animated characters to dance around and all of that. And when Walt came up, what they did is uh, Uncle Remus has a, has a rocking chair 
So they gave Walt a rocking chair, and on the back of it they wrote Uncle Walt, just like Uncle Remus. And that is the very first time that Walt was called Uncle Walt. And so he was on that, the set, and then they came back uh, uh, to Hollywood and filmed some things on a, uh, uh, a sound stage. And so Walt was ready for this film. However, times were tough. You know, as I said, segregation was still in place. Not only was segregation still in place, but lynchings were still in place. And there, the NAACP was trying to uh, convince President Truman to sign an anti-lynching law, which he refused to do. And so, you know, this is a rough thing. And so what happened is the NAACP took a look at this and said, well, the Uncle Remus stories, that, that's told in dialect, and, you know, and, and this is going to be demeaning to uh, African Americans. And uh, even though there were other films out there, there was Shirley Temple, who was dancing with uh, Bill Bojangles uh, Robinson in, in, in The Little Colonel and the, the Littlest Rebel. And those took place during the Civil War. Uh, Song of the South takes place at Reconstruction, which happens after the Civil War. You know that for a fact, because when you see the movie, at one point, Uncle Remus uh, packs up his stuff and says, I'm not taking this anymore, I'm going. If you were a slave, you couldn't do that. You were property. You know, it obviously takes place at a different... But again, the, the Disney uh, company is not totally in, innocent. They should have had, you know, at the beginning of the film, identifying the time period, whatever. But a lot of people took a look at it, and instead of looking at the film decided, oh, well, this is, they, they've, they've got African Americans who are singing spirituals, they're in threadbare clothes, this is horrendous, you know, this is how Hollywood sees us. They didn't take a look at the fact that the, uh, uh, the African Americans who were in threadbare clothing and singing uh, spirit, spirituals was the Hall Johnson Choir, a very prestigious choir from back east. And in fact, Hall Johnson was adamant about the rights of African Americans, so he would never have appeared in anything demeaning. And I had I had the good fortune when I uh, I lived out in California for many years, and I was actually out there when Splash Mountain opened in '89. I had a chance to talk to uh, Nick Stewart. Uh, Nick Stewart did the voice of Brer Bear, and the Disney Company had brought him back to do the voice of Brer Bear in the attraction. So when you hear Brer Bear in the attraction, that's Nick Stewart. He was in his 70s at that point. And I went up to him and I said, well, Mr. Stewart, you know, I, I don't want to be uh, uh, offensive or, or, or rude, but I, I feel I, I, I need to ask, when you, when you were doing Song of the South, did, did you feel uh, demeaned? You know, I know there were only certain roles open uh, to African-American uh, performers. And he just let out this huge laugh. And he said, you know what I did with the money? And I said, no. And I remembered that... One of the things my dad had told me is it's okay to look like an idiot for five minutes if you look like a hero for the rest of your life. Little did, little did he realize that a couple of decades later I'd be looking at a hero here at Winter Park Library. I said, no, no sir, what, what did you do with the money? He had used the money to establish in Los Angeles the Ebony Theater, which was a theater where African Americans could play roles other than butlers and maids. And he says, the money I'm getting from doing Splash Mountain here, that's going right back into the theater. Wow. So anyway, the film was released. Most critics liked the animation. Most critics liked James Basquiat. The, the rest of it, this was the very first live action film that the Disney Company had made. This is officially the first live action film that the Disney Company made. And it was very melodramatic. It, 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 it has some some very, very sappy moments. A lot of times people fast forward just to the animation. But um, that doesn't mean it's a, a horrible, horrible film, but some people jumped in and said, how could Walt Disney do this? And oh, A lot of African-American newspapers said, we love this film, you know? This is not, you, you, you show a, a, a little white boy and his best friend is a little black boy of the, of, of the same age and they're out there, they're playing and there's no condescending on, on any of this. And, um, and, and Uncle Remus, what a wonderful character. And, and he heals the boy, he heals the boy's family who's, who's estranged. 
And actually, interestingly enough, Ruth Warwick, who most of you know from soap operas, uh, played the mother because as, as an actor, sometimes you have to be careful about admitting you know, what's going on in your life. She had never revealed that she was married and she had a kid. And the person she was married to was Eric Rolf, who had ca been cast as her husband. And they both had a son named John, and they divorced shortly after this. But again, didn't admit that she was married because when you're a young actress, you want to seem so that audiences, and I know what you're thinking, you know, I've got a shot at Ruth Warwick, you know? So that, you're sitting there thinking that, but if she was married, I know you're a gentleman that you'd go, no, no, that's all right. Just in my dreams, I'm moving on. Uh, so the husband and wife in the film were husband and wife in real life, but absolutely nobody knew, not even Walt Disney. Uh, Alice Davis, who was the wife of Mark Davis, who did some of the animation, said, yeah, we were on the set and we had no clue. <laughs> no clue. And no clue that they were, you know, having difficulties and battling back and forth. Ruth Warwick, by the way, later went on to um, help with uh, Operation Bootstrap uh, out in um, uh, Los Angeles and taught black studies in Harlem and was part of the Martin Luther King Society. So you have all of these people, this is not a racist film. And Walt, of course, w w was not racist at all. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, my book, Who's Afraid of the Song of the South, the foreword is by Floyd Norman. Floyd Norman was the first black animator and black story man hired at the Disney studio. And Walt Disney was, was uh, uh, still alive. And I said, well, Floyd, did you see any hint and he said, no, no, he treated us all alike, as if we were idiots. <laughs> <laughs> he said he treated me no different than anybody else. He, he, he was a, t a tough worker. He says, I was there in story meetings, and he listened to my ideas the same as he listened to anybody else uh, sitting there, and he rejected my ideas the same as he rejected anybody else's. Mm -hmm. And um, so Floyd believes the film should be re-released as well, but he wrote the uh, forward for that. And so... The film, very popular, and uh, it would continue to be re-released. Uh, in fact, the first re-release was in 1956. And um, there's an interesting story. The little girl in the film, Luana Patton, uh, was an actress, but she left acting to continue her, her education. In 1956, she was a high school uh, girl who was working in a theater the night that it was robbed, the night that it was showing Song of the South. So, um, all sorts of interesting uh, coincidences there, and it kept being re-released. But as you got into the 1970s, culture changed. And so things that were acceptable years ago are no longer acceptable. And so the Disney company said in 1970, well, we don't think we should release this film uh, again because you know, of, of, of the nature of tensions that are out there and misunderstanding. But again, in 1971, they did. And then they continued to release it. And in 1986, they released it, and it was the highest grossing re-release in the history of the Disney company. But at that particular point, Michael Eisner said, this is a no-win situation. We're just going to pull this away. So we will not release this in the United States. And so it has not been legally seen in the United States since 1986, except I, I, I think there's been uh, two or three museum showings, uh, retrospectives, but that was it. However, it's been shown all over the world since 1986. They show it in the UK, they actually show it on BBC Two, they show it at the Christmas time, and there's been no rioting in the streets. They show it in South America, they show it in Europe, they show it uh, overseas in Japan. In fact, some of you who do have copies may have a dub yes. from, yes, from Japan, and, and you notice during the songs you have the little Japanese, so I'm hoping you've learned Japanese now, uh, from that, or, or you've, you've gotten the uh, version from the UK, and that was a different VHS system, so that had to be adapted if, if you got that. And people around the world are fine with it. It is just folks in the United States who have not been able to see it. But people keep sneaking and seeing it including Imagineers. And so back when uh, Michael Eisner came on board, uh, 1984, one of the things 
uh, Imagineers wanted to do was come up with some projects to wow him and excite him so uh, they would be on the good team and would be given the go-ahead to go with, with some projects. One of the challenges they had uh, at, at Disney, and challenge is a Disney word, at Disney, I, I w I was a, I'm a former Disney cast member. At Disney, you never use the word problem. And there's a reason for that. Here's, a, here, here's an absolute true story. All right? When America started to go into outer space, the first astronauts were actually test pilots. You know, because they felt, you know, they had that type of training and endurance and, and all of this. And how they recorded information was with a pen and paper. You know, so you're recording information from the dials and all that. You're doing this with pen and paper. However, when you're in outer space, there's no gravity. So the ink doesn't come to the point of the pen. Houston, we have a problem. So this is a true story. The United States worked for five years, spent multi-million dollars developing a pen that could write in zero gravity and in massive heat and in massive cold, the Russians used a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> because what happened is you took a look at that and you said, well, this is a problem. This pen doesn't work. 